Hi, this is Alban at Stormont Presbyterian Church and wherever you are and whoever you're with, you're welcome as we come together uh, to pray, to read, uh, to listen and reflect on what God's saying to us. So I'm going to invite you to, to join me in prayer. Uh, prayer is a, a bit like Wi-Fi really. Um, it's invisible but it connects us uh, to who we need uh, to be connected to, God. So will you come and join me? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for uh, this wonderful privilege and this wonderful opportunity of being able to talk with you. We thank you that you listen to each of our prayers uh, because we matter to you and what's happening around us and in our lives matters to you. You are an awesome God, a God of creation, a God of power, a God of authority. And yet in your goodness and in your grace, you've come into our world in Jesus and you stepped in uh, to take on life with all its challenges and all its uh, difficulties. And you walked this earth, you faced uh, the, the challenges and the difficulties. And ultimately in Jesus, uh, our, our need, our greatest need was met. He died in our place and on our behalf. He died to pay the price for our sin, that we might be set free from that, that we might be invited into relationship with you, that we might be able to call you Father. And that's what we do. We come to you as our Father and we come wanting and needing your embrace, needing your love and your peace and your grace and your reassurance. So as we take this time to worship, as we take this time uh, to read your word and to listen for your voice, speak to us, Father, through those words. Speak to us words that will comfort us and reassure us. Speak to us words that will give us hope and direction and may we by the power of your spirit be able to receive those words understand those words and respond to those words hear this our prayer for we ask it in Jesus name amen this week we're beginning a new series of studies and we're going to be looking at uh, the book of Exodus. So if you'd like to turn with me to Exodus, it's uh, the second book in the Old Testament and we're going to read uh, just a few verses, a little story from Exodus uh, chapter 2. So let's listen to this story. Now a man of the house of Levi married a Levite woman. And she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the riverbank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her slave girl to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying, and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. And the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this baby and nurse him for me, and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. And when the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses saying, I drew him out of the water. Amen. When my children were much younger, every journey, uh, whether it was long or short, was punctuated by a persistent question. 
are we there yet? I wonder over the last little while, have you been asking that question? Are we there yet? Is it over? How much further? When will we get there? And the truth is, no one knows right now. The best that we can say is that we're on a journey. The destination is unclear. We have a sense that life and the world will be somewhat different when we emerge from this part of the journey. But what we have just now is the journey. And journey is a great word to use when thinking about the storyline of the Bible. And we're going to look at the journey of one man, the story of his journey, that ultimately led to the journey of a whole nation. The destination was unclear. The promised land was just that, a promise. No coordinates, no location, no place names. The story of Moses and the Exodus is the story of a journey. It combines personal struggle, political confrontation, and miraculous events, and God. God who involves himself, God who reveals himself, and God who invites his people to follow him. Exodus presents us with something of a blueprint for journeying with God. And I believe that the journey that we're on at the moment gives us time and space to be with God, to know God, and to journey with God. So I invite you to join me over the next few weeks as we explore Moses' journey and the journey of the Israelite nation as they discover the amazing power and the intimate love of God in breathtaking ways. Now, the first thing that strikes me about this story is its title, uh, Exodus. It's like a 21st century title, isn't it? It's short, it's snappy. It tells you exactly what the story is all about. Or does it? Exodus is the Greek title for this book, taken from the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Septuagint. And Exodus means departure. And it's very accurate. It describes the key event in the story. Moses and the Israelite nation leaving or departing Egypt en route to the land that God had promised their forefathers. What's intriguing, however, is when we look at the Hebrew title for this book. The Hebrew title for this book is the word Shemot, which means names. It's taken from the second word in the opening sentence of the book. And this title points us to the fact that this story is about more than an epic event. This story is about people, people who were called to take a journey, a journey that would lead them away from a set of circumstances that they were familiar with, though not altogether happy with, a journey that would transform their lives utterly, but a journey that would be painful and difficult, a journey that would involve challenges and choices. The journey that you and I are on just now is a journey that has taken us away from circumstances that we were familiar with. Though if we're honest, those circumstances we often mumbled and grumbled and complained about. We understood them, even if we didn't like them. Now we find ourselves in an altogether different scenario. The world is an unfamiliar place. We don't understand what's going on. We don't know where it's going or where it's leading. So how can we cope with such a journey? There was little warning and so little time to prepare. And how would we have prepared anyway? And we desperately look for reassurance, don't we? For comfort, for peace in our souls and above all for hope. And where are we to go and find what we need? Well, I want to invite you 
to look at this story with me. Because in this story, we're going to discover the reassurance and the comfort and the peace and above all, the hope that we need. Now, as the story of Moses and the Israelite nation opens up in Exodus chapter 1, the picture that's painted in those opening seven verses is very promising and it's very positive. Even though, as a people, they are living in a foreign land. Now, that was the result of a famine, but also God's provision through his servant Joseph. And you can read about Joseph in Genesis chapter 37 and following. Joseph had won the respect and the trust of the king of Egypt. And so the king welcomed all of Joseph's extended family, all 70 of them. And we're told that they prospered and they grew. Now, by the time we pick up the story here in Exodus, Joseph and those 70 relatives have long since died. But their descendants have multiplied. And indeed, the writer tells us that they are exceedingly numerous. Now, that's where the problem begins. The new king who's emerged has no knowledge of Joseph. And he perceives the Israelites to be a threat. So the promising positive picture of verses 1 to 7 gives way to a bleak, dark, foreboding and dangerous, deadly picture in verses 8 and following of chapter 1. A picture that's dominated by exploitation and abuse and the ruthless murder of Israelite or Hebrew baby boys at birth. And it's into this bleak and terrible picture that God begins to act. It's, it's, like a, it's like a disaster movie. The picture that we have is dreadful and dark and foreboding and there appears to be no obvious uh, resolution. It, it cries out for uh, uh, an intervention, a dramatic intervention. It cries out for a hero. A, a deliverer and, and we get a hint of this in verse 17 the Hebrew or Israelite midwives although they were under the, the authority of the king they allowed the male babies to live why they feared God they respected and honored God they sought to live God's way and so into this bleak picture, God acts. And he does so through the integrity and the dedication of the midwives. Now, it's an inauspicious start for a story of redemption and freedom. But it's a start nonetheless. And it's a start that heralds the arrival of the hero. Though, as we're going to discover, he was something of a reluctant hero. This story sees God working. And incredible though it may seem, God chooses to work through people. Because Moses arrives under the, the threat of death. And yet, though he was a Hebrew baby, an Egyptian princess finds him and his mother is employed to be his nurse. And we begin to see God's plan unfold and emerge through people. And this is a feature of God's story. It always involves people. So that's the second thing I want you to notice. Just as the title of this book, Shemot, names, pointed us beyond the epic event to the fact that this is a story about people, now this incredible, extraordinary scene by the banks of the River Nile, with a baby in a basket, an Egyptian princess, the baby's sister suggesting to the princess that she employ a Hebrew mother to nurse the baby, 
And then with permission, summoning the baby's mother to be that nurse, God is at work. What we have here in broad brushstrokes is an extraordinary story of God at work through people. But it's a story that points prophetically to a, a glorious technical story that we find in the Gospels. Because what God does through Moses for the Israelites here, God in Jesus has done for the whole world. Jesus' arrival was every bit as inauspicious as Moses. Born to a, a couple from humble origins, with a feeding trough for his bed, having to flee because a king had issued an edict that all male children should be killed at birth. Jesus' arrival was every bit as traumatic as Moses. But God was at work through people. And God became a person to work out his plan. The journey that you and I are on at this point in time is one that fills us with with fear and those fears are real it's one that fills us with uh, anxiety and uncertainty we can't uh, understand what's going on around us and what's going on in us but i want you to know this god is at work and he's at work in your life and in my life Crisis has uh, a habit of helping us to rethink and reevaluate and reconsider. And in these days in which we're living, we have that time and space because the tyranny of the urgent and the busyness that always threaten to engulf us has been halted. Now, the dangers are real. We know that. And the fears that we experience are real. We know that too. And the pain and the suffering and the sadness, the distress and the anxiety and the uncertainty, all of that is real. We don't know the future. We can't predict the future. So we have to live in the moment. And in the moment, we discover what really matters. In the moment we discover what's of real value. As we look at this story of Moses and the people of Israel, we see that God is at work, that God's story is continuing, that their story is continuing. And our story continues even in these extraordinary circumstances that we're living in. And God's story continues. The Exodus story had a place for God's people. And the gospel story has a place for all people. But the question I want to put to you this morning is this. Does your story have a place for God? Journeys begin with the first step and that first step is often difficult it's often challenging it's often not straightforward and that was certainly true for Jesus and for Moses and the journey that we're on is difficult and challenging and those first few weeks were bewildering but in these moments and in these days that we're living through now as we continue to seek for comfort and reassurance, as we continue to seek for peace of mind and, and, and heart and soul, and above all, as we continue to seek for hope, then I want you to look closely at that intimate scene by the banks of the River Nile. Look and see the intimate care of this baby in a basket. Moses in the bulrushes. 
Because this poignant picture reveals God's comfort, God's care, God's reassurance, God's peace, and above all, God's hope. So this morning, I want to invite you. I want to encourage you. I want to urge you to let God's story be your story. That as he invites you into his story right now, that you will invite him into your story, into your heart, your soul, your mind, into your whole story. And that as you do that, you will experience his comfort, his peace, his reassurance, and his hope. Join me as we pray, will you? Let's pray. Father, we will be really honest with you today. Uh, we are weary and we are struggling. All that we knew and understood and loved has been taken from us in many ways. Our lives have been stripped back. They've been made simpler perhaps, but at the same time more difficult. And so we come with a mixture of emotions, struggling to cope with how we feel from day to day, struggling to cope with the thoughts that uh, invade our minds, trying to process information that is beyond us at times, trying to, to see ahead, but it seems so unclear and so foggy. We come to you and we are grateful and we are thankful that your vision is not unclear and it's not foggy. That your plan is working out. That you're at work in our lives right now. And so I pray you'll help us to catch a glimpse of what you're doing in our lives right now. And Father, our concern, our, our burden is for the people around us as much as for ourselves. We, we're concerned for our family, especially the older members of our family, especially those who have health issues, those who feel vulnerable and frightened. We're concerned for those who are um, serving in dangerous places and we would never have seen hospitals and medical facilities as dangerous places for those serving but we recognize that and for those who support them in their work the cleaners the, the, the domestics the, the, the people making food all of that is anxious for them and so we we, we pray for them today for those who deliver our goods and stock our shelves and serve at the counters of our shops and supermarkets. Father, we pray protection upon them. For those who are on furlough, who are no longer employed doing what they had loved and enjoyed, we pray for them. For those who are anxious about the future in terms of employment and finance and how they might support their families. Father, bring your peace into their hearts and minds. Father, we continue to recognize the huge challenges facing our leaders, both locally, nationally, and internationally. And we pray that you will give them clarity of thought. You will give them courage and you will give them wisdom as they make decisions that will impact our lives, not just today, but for many months and perhaps even for many years to come. Father, in all of this, in these extraordinary circumstances, 
we pray for an outpouring of your spirit. We pray that you will open us all, not, not just us, but open us all in this island uh, to your love and your grace, to the good news in Jesus. And may we as a people continue to pray for that. May we as a people take every opportunity to share that good news in our emails, in our texts, in our Facebook posts, in our, on our social media, by telephone. May we be people of promise and people of hope who share that promise and who share that hope. Father, we thank you that in Jesus, we have one who understands us and one who gave his life for us. And so we come in his name and we come joining together in the words that he has taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Along with this message, we have posted uh, two songs for you today. Uh, one is uh, a very traditional, well-known piece, Blessed Assurance. And the other is a Hill Songs piece, My Story. But they both relate well to the message that we've just been considering. In Blessed Assurance, the refrain said, this is my story, this is my song, praising my Saviour all the day long. And in my story, we pick up that same idea that in, we have in the story of the gospel, we have in Jesus Christ, one in whom we can trust and rely on, one in whom we can find peace and comfort and strength. So I pray they will be a blessing and an encouragement to you. If you're watching this on Sunday morning, then this afternoon we're joining with many others, uh, the length and breadth of this island, uh, to pray between three o'clock and four o'clock. And if you uh, check out our Facebook page this afternoon, just before that, we'll have some resources uh, to help you and assist you as we pray for ourselves, our city, our country and our world. I want to pray that in this week that lies ahead, uh, you will discover afresh God's comfort and reassurance, God's peace and love, and most of all, God's hope. Now let me pray a blessing for you and those whom you're with today. May the amazing grace of the Master, Jesus Christ, and the extravagant love of God the Father and the intimate friendship of God the Holy Spirit be with you now and always.